Great to be with you this morning. I am Scott Maxwell. Good morning, Grace Bible Church. Um, I've had the privilege uh, to be the executive director of Finister Vision since May of this year, so for about six months now. Uh, Finister Vision began um, about 10 years ago when we were training our first team here at Grace Bible Church um, to be missionary church planters in the Finister Mountains of Papua New Guinea. Uh, many of you know very well what Finister Vision is, but I think there's a growing number of people in our church who may not know what Finister Vision is. And so either way, um, it is an opportunity to update you on what Finister Vision is doing, or it is an opportunity to introduce you to Finister Vision. But before we do that, let's pray together. Will you pray with me? Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for um, who you are to us and what you have done for us. We rejoice this morning that you are the kind of God that you are, that you are full of mercy, and you are full of grace, and you are powerful. You are powerful to save sinners like us, people like us who were only plotting hourly our next sinister deed of rebellion against you. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And while we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to you, Father, by the death of your Son, by his blood. And so we worship you this morning, and we love you, and we express our great need for you, our desire to serve you, and even our desire to see your Son's name be glorified to the ends of the earth. And it is in his great name that we pray. Amen. Well, what I want to do to you, uh, with you this morning is I, I want to introduce you to Finister Vision, but to really do that, we have to first begin with um, just the, the basic presupposition that is in the book of Acts. The basic presupp presupposition in the book of Acts, because when you understand that, then you'll understand clearly where Finister Vision sits and where it does not sit, what it can do and what it cannot do. So I'm going to give you kind of the basic uh, presupposition statement here, and it's this. The missionary activity that you see unfolding in the book of Acts is missionary church planting through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the missionary activity that you see taking place in the book of Acts. Missionary church planting through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to turn to Matthew 16, verse 18, and I'm going to walk you through passages that you know well, that you've seen. I'm not going to tell you probably anything new this morning, but we're just going to remind ourselves of these foundational truths. Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus, speaking to Peter with his other apostles listening in, said, Matthew 16, 18, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus tells Peter and the rest of the apostles that he himself is the one who will go and build his church. Now, as you turn to Matthew 28 and read this next very familiar verse and passage, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Jesus tells us how the church would actually become identifiable. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and he said to them, after his death, after his resurrection, his disciples are gathered he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There is not a, a display or a, a, a kind of authority someplace that Jesus does not have yet at this point. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. It has been given to him. On the basis of that, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
So he tells us how the church would actually then become identifiable as such. Disciples would be made in all the nations through the preaching of the gospel, and those believers were then to be baptized, and their public baptism would help separate them out publicly from the rest of society and identify them as his called out ones, the church that he is building. And they would then be together and be taught to be obedient to all that Jesus commanded them. And he promised them his authoritative presence to keep doing this to the end of the age. So then when you get to the book of Acts, that unfolds exactly that task taking place. From Jerusalem all the way to the, across the Mediterranean world to the capital city of Rome, Acts is not primarily telling narrower stories of individual evangelistic endeavors taking place here and there, although God does put those on display. But rather, Acts is telling the broader story of the gathering of believers into churches through the preaching of the gospel. Okay, that's what Acts is telling. Acts is the account of missionary church planting across the Mediterranean world through the preaching of the gospel. Acts is about churches sending out missionary church planters. The book of Acts unfolds churches supporting missionary church planters as they preach the gospel from one place to the next across the Mediterranean world. And Jesus was not only or merely saving individuals, but he was building his church. And we know the extent to which this missionary church planting through the preaching of the gospel was to go. In Matthew 28, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Um, Luke's account, Luke 24, verse 47, says, Repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in Jesus' name to all the nations. Now turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We'll look at that commissioning statement there, Acts 1, 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told his small band of disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, which, by the way, is what Finisterre means in Latin, right? To the end of the earth. And in Acts 13, verse 47, Paul, on his first missionary journey in Pisidian Antioch, has been preaching the gospel in the synagogues. The Jews have rejected the message, begun to persecute him and the Gentiles who have believed. So Paul and Barnabas turn to the Gentiles, and he says in Acts 13, verse 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the nations, for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So we know the extent to which this missionary church planting through the preaching of the gospel was to go. It is to go all the way to the ends of the earth, to all of the nations. Well, how are these guys, how are these apostles going to go to the end of the earth with this to every nation? Well, remind yourself, this is a commission that will take place to the end of the age also in order to get the ends of the earth. So obviously this great commission goes well beyond these men. And finally, one last great passage to look at here just by way of introduction. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Revelation 5, verse 9. Again, these are very familiar to you. We get a glimpse into the throne room of heaven where worship of the Lamb who was slain is taking place. And this is what we see. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll, which is the title deed to the earth, and to open its seals. Why is he worthy to be able to do this and open it? Because you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and 
every language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So we get to peer into heaven's worship of the lamb who was slain, and we discover that he indeed did purchase a people for God by his blood, a people from every tribe, every language, every nation, and this missionary church planting through the preaching of the gospel is a world-sized endeavor. And it is guaranteed to be successful by the builder of the church because the builder of the church is the buyer of the church. He bought them with his own blood. So Acts reveals the church's great privilege to raise up qualified missionary church planters for this world-sized gospel agenda. The church occupies a front and center position in this gospel mandate. And only when you understand that can you begin to understand where Finister Vision even fits in. So the basic presupposition is that missionary church planting through the preaching of the gospel has the church front and center in that role. Finister Vision is not front and center in that position and in that role. So what is Finister Vision? Well, if we are not front and center in that, the best that we can be is behind and alongside the church in that role that is front and center. You see, Finister Vision really has no authority at all in itself to declare a missionary church planter to be qualified for the task. But the church does. And Finister Vision has no authority really to send any missionary church planter anywhere. The church does. And so maybe it could be said that Finister Vision has this behind and alongside role to the front and center position of the church. Finister Vision wants to get behind and come alongside churches who are convinced of their own front and center role in the gospel mandate of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And so we get behind and come alongside churches who have raised up or are raising up their own qualified missionary church planters who will preach the gospel to the nations. And as we do come alongside the church, we get to do something unique. We get to shine a spotlight on a very unique location on the earth, Papua New Guinea, the most linguistically diverse place on the planet. And in particular, we are encouraging churches to look at one little mountain range, the Finisterre Mountain Range. And across that small mountain range, there are upwards of 70 language groups yet unreached with the gospel of Jesus Christ, in desperate need of having the scriptures in their own mother language, mother tongue, and the gospel in their own heart language, and they're in desperate need of the church. The church that Jesus alone builds, that Jesus alone bought with his own blood. Missionary church planting in that region is desperately needed and it requires churches willing to persevere and sacrifice greatly. It will be 10 to 15 or more years actually on the field to accomplish that, to plant a church, to translate the scriptures, to establish an indigenous leadership in the church, to leave a well-established church behind. That doesn't even count how many years it takes on the front end, stateside, to be qualified in character and in ability to be able to go. Uh, that's quite a perseverance and reliance on the Lord that is needed. The last that these unreached language groups heard from their maker was when, and you've heard this said this way, that when he scattered them at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, about 4,000 years ago. And when God created all of those new languages as he dispersed that rebel human race, that's when God planned then for the need for language learning in the Great Commission. He planned then 
for language literacy. He planned then for Bible translation to take place. He planned then for cultural learning and cultural adaptation to take place. Those kinds of activities become inseparable components in missionary church planting through the preaching of the gospel in the Finister Mountains of Papua New Guinea. So behind the church, or alongside the church, Finister Vision is shining a spotlight on the need for churches to send their qualified church planners to this corner of the world to preach the gospel. So what we're looking for is we're looking for churches, like the church in Antioch of Syria. In Acts chapter 13, do you remember Paul and Barnabas were sent from that church on Paul's first missionary journey? That church was a well-established church. It had many prophets and many teachers in it, and they gathered together to pray. The Spirit made it clear to them whom they were to send out, and they sent their very best. They sent Paul, and they sent Barnabas, and the missionary world of the Mediterranean was, was never the same. We're eager to partner with churches like that, but we are also eager to partner with churches that may not be able yet to send out their own. I want you to turn to Titus, the book of Titus. If you were around when we went through the book of Titus, you'll remember that the Apostle Paul and Titus came across the island of Crete around AD 65. And as they were on the Crete, when, as they went from town to town, they found churches that were not in order as they should be. They were not well established. And so Paul and Titus together began to set the churches in order. And then Paul left Titus on the island of Crete alone to be able to finish that work. And he says in verse 5 of chapter 1, This is why I left you, Titus, in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. And primarily how they were going to put the church in order is found in the next statement and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So the way that the church was going to become strengthened on the island of Crete was that they were going to identify qualified elder leadership and these men would hold fast, verse 9, they would hold fast the word of God in such a way that they would be able to exhort with sound doctrine the church who was teachable and they would become more godly, and they would also, with the word of God, those elders would refute those who contradict the message of the gospel and the sound doctrine. And they would establish the church. It would be put in order the way that it needs to. We want to get behind and come alongside churches even like that, because at the end of the letter, go to chapter 3, verse 12. In these closing remarks from Paul to Titus, this church that is coming out of its disordered state and coming more and more into a greater established position gets to hear this from the Apostle Paul to Titus. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best, Titus, to come to me at Nicopolis because I've decided to spend the winter there. So this church that would have been focused in on becoming established in sound doctrine would have had their eyes raised up off of their own church, and they would have looked to the north, and they would have seen that Titus is going to leave them and go to, to Paul, who would be far north, looking to take the gospel into the heart of the continent of Europe. And then he says this, Verse 13, do your best to send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. So Zenos the lawyer and Apollos, who is from Alexandria, Egypt, were coming, and they are the ones who brought the letter to Titus. And the next thing that the church would have seen that was being put into order is they would have seen coming from the north these two missionary church planners heading south, possibly going to Alexandria, Egypt, or the North Africa to take the gospel there. So the gospel's going further north into the European continent, and the gospel's probably going into the north of Africa. And this church that's being established would have watched Titus, heard him, seen him, make sure that these missionary church planters lacked nothing. They could not come to the church and leave the church with some kind of need still yet unmet. And Paul says this in verse 14, and let our people, that's the church, let them learn to devote themselves to good works. Well, what kind of good works are you talking about? The ones just mentioned, so that they can help 
people uh, help meet these urgent needs, these pressing missionary church planting needs and not to be unfruitful. So Paul's intent for even a church that is coming out of maybe a disordered season or coming into um, a, an established position, he even wants them to participate in taking the gospel to the ends of the earth by making sure that every pressing missionary need is met. We want to partner with churches like that. We want to get behind and come alongside churches like the church in Antioch of Syria who are ready to send their best to the ends of the earth. And we want to come alongside and partner with churches who are ready to meet every need that somebody else as missionary church planters have. So that is what Finister Vision is. Well, how do we do that? How do we get behind and come alongside a church? Church planting in the Finister Mountains of Papua New Guinea is a very unique task, and it requires some very specific knowledge and experience and relationships, partnerships, to be able to carry out that church planting. And this is most likely a, a set of knowledge and a collection of experiences and relationships that elders of local churches in the U.S. may not possess themselves. So Finish Their Vision can come alongside elders and we can assist them with our knowledge, with our experience, and with our relationships and partnerships that we have stateside and in Papua New Guinea with sister ministries there. Uh, we have no desire to displace the elders of churches from their oversight of their missionaries, but we can do specific tasks and provide unique care and support for their church planters that then frees up the elders to shepherd and guide their church planting teams in other ways. Finister Vision has experience in doing tribal surveys and making tribal selections that can assist the missionary church planters and their elders as they select a strategic language group to enter. We have partnership with sister ministries on this side of the earth, state side, that can help equip and train churches, missionaries, uh, church planters, like learning how to take an oral language of a tribe and move that tribe toward an alphabet and towards literacy. We have partnership with sister ministries in Papua New Guinea um, we are not able to do it on our own. We have to have a cooperative um, partnership with other ministries who are willing to serve us, like by flying our missionaries in and out of the villages in the highlands in their helicopters and flying in supplies for missionaries and doing medical evacuations. Finister Vision has experience teaching a, a chronological series of Bible lessons that unfolds the gospel of Jesus Christ and a sinner's need for repentance and faith in him. We have experience in gathering those who believe the message and establishing them in the gospel. This is what Team Doe is doing right now. Zach and Cass uh, were in the midst of that as they left on furlough and now the Mitchells are back doing more of the same. Gathering them into a fledgling church and Finister Vision has partnership with a unique partnership with SIL, Summer Institute of Linguistics, now called SIL International. They lease to us a great facility um, in Medang from which we can provide all of the logistical support and care that missionary church planters need on that side of the earth. So Finister Vision can come alongside and get behind elders and their church planning teams with, these, with this kind of skill set so that elders can focus on providing the spiritual care of their church planning teams. Maybe we resemble, like in the church, maybe we resemble something like deacons coming alongside elders, freeing them up to do their pastoral role more effectively. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about um, a current team that we're building. You know we have Team Doe, and there is Team Pano uh, that has been over um, in Medang. And we are in the process of building a new team um, called Team Medang. In the past, Finister Vision, uh, through Jeremy Lehman, developed the logistics coordinator role in Medang. Uh, Jeremy is the one who designed that and built it and established that logistics coordinator role better than anybody could have ever imagined. 
um, he was able to create really great relationship and partnership with other ministries over there as well. And the layman's were God's uh, choice instruments for the development of that role. And they served in that role in Medang, the port city there that serves the highlands of the um, Finister Mountains. They served in that role for five years there. And they have been home now, you know, for over a year and a half, and Jeremy has transitioned into becoming the business manager for Finister Vision stateside. And that LC role in Medang, um, you know, has been a very difficult role for us to fill, an elusive role to fill. Well, what we've learned over the years with lots of input from, and counsel from even our missionary church planners is that what is needed in Medang is not just an individual or a couple, but it's a team, a team. A team is actually in our best interest. The opportunity for much greater full-bodied ministry exists in Medang for a team serving there. So what might Team Medang accomplish with maybe two or three couples? Here's what we're praying about and aiming for. Obviously, still, we need to pro provide logistics, coordination for our church planning teams in the highlands, the week in, week out, month in, month out, care that missionary church planting teams need in the highlands must continue to be provided, and so we'll certainly keep doing that. But here is where we're hoping to prayerfully expand the ministry of the team in Medang. Team Medang will have um, somewhat of a pastoral function, and we will serve as an extension of the oversight of local churches stateside. Team Medang can provide counsel and encouragement for church planting teams in the highlands, refreshment for them. Uh, uh, members from this team, Medang, can go up into the tribes and spend time and bring encouragement and counsel, correction to missionary church planting teams. Parts of the team can come down into Medang and stay on our facility there with us, with this team. And this team can be the hands and the feet of sending churches and their elders when their elders and pastors cannot be there to care for them. It's a crucial role to add or a dimension to add. Team Medang, we're also praying, will be able to engage in some important translation work, primarily translation uh, with the trade language, Tok Pisin. Uh, it's a language that's common to all across Papua New Guinea. It's kind of the one language that unites a lot of different people groups, language groups. A more accurate Bible translation would serve many churches and believers and church planners discipleship resources, evangelism resources, pastoral training resources could be translated into this trade language and supplement, supplement the church planting efforts taking place in the highlands. For instance, in the village, Zach um, will be laboring, is laboring even now to translate the Bible into the Doe language for the tribe. It is crucial for the tribe to have um, the Bible in their own heart language. And when Zach translates the Bible in Do, Zach, um, how many other unreached langu language groups will benefit from that translation? Just your tribal group. But many also speak talk pisin in the tribe, and supplemental resources can supplement discipleship effort in the tribe and a good talk piss and resource collection can be used across many tribes, all tribes, again, to supplement, not replace Bible translation efforts in the heart language of the tribes. So it is an opportunity to come alongside and add even more resources. We're praying about that. We're also praying about the possibility of engaging with Team Medang in church planting or church strengthening in the city of Medang itself. Um, the church is there uh, probably resemble the churches across the island of Crete in the book of Titus. They could benefit from um, greater establishment through the raising up of qualified elders who can handle accurately the word of God before the church family. And we just wonder what it might be like maybe in five to ten years or more that uh, a church in Medang will be ready to raise up and send their own New Guinean qualified missionary church planners into the highlands. We're going to pray about that. And then we're also looking for this team to aim to establish a pastoral training center 
at some point on our facility in Medang, Lord willing. Pastoral training could be offered to the churches in Medang to help strengthen them. But men being discipled for church leadership in tribal villages can come down from the highlands to our facility in Medang and engage in shorter seminar sessions of pastoral training and take resources back up into their villages. You can tell this is a monumental ministry opportunity. Um, we are biting off, I'm sure, far more than we can chew, but we're trusting that um, Jesus can take a really big bite. And so what is clear to us is that this team must be the next team that we send. It has to be the next team we send. Before we attempt to send another missionary church planning anywhere into any mountain tribe, Team Medang needs to be solidly in place, ready to receive and support these tribal teams and be busy at work. And exciting news to tell you is that Team Medang is beginning to be formed even now um, by a, a church in Stewart, Florida, Community Baptist Church. Um, it's a great church. God has been really gracious to that church. Philip Smith is the teaching pastor there, and they have been laboring uh, to train up men who are eager to function pastorally. And, and get this, that they're actually eager to fulfill a pastoral role on that Medang team. The question that is being asked all throughout that church right now to people is, why not Medang? So they're asking their people that they're discipling, why should you not go to Medang? You need a good reason to not go. And so they are prayerfully um, considering this, plot, plotting and planning towards that direction. Uh, I recently just spent a week with Philip Smith there in the church, and I got to meet with so many of these couples who are prayerfully considering the roles on Team Medang, and there is such a like-heartedness uh, if you were there, you would feel like you were at home. I felt like I was at home in that church. Uh, Community Baptist Church has their annual missions conference this February that they hold, and actually the focal point of that conference is going to be Finister Vision and what our ministry is and does alongside the local church. And that conference will also highlight the need in that church, in their church, for other team members to join the couple that has been identified as being the first um, part of that team, and that's Brian and Kara Twombly. Some of you were able to meet them. They were recently out here with us uh, in Phoenix. Um, while I was there with them, um, I was able to meet with them again and meet with many other couples and just uh, answer questions and get to know them better. Uh, it's just very the, such a sweet couple, Brian and Kara and their family. When we go to the conference in February, uh, February, Lord willing, the Cans will be able to go with us. The Laymans are planning to go. Cameron Dodd and crew are planning to go. Um, Craig and Sarah Noyes are supported by their, uh, that church as well. Some of you know them, and Kim and I will be going. I get to preach the main sessions of the conference, and we just ask for you to pray for the, um, that, that God would raise up and identify those team members, and that that conference will really be a launching pad for that. Let me give you some other updates just on our Finister Vision family. We have Team Doe, as you know here at Grace Bible Church, the cans are home. They are resting. Well, everybody except Cass is resting, or yeah. Weren't you supposed to have a baby yesterday? What are you doing here? You got some work to do. We're with you on that. Lord willing, a little one will be here soon any moment, and they will return to the tribe, Lord willing, uh, in June of next year. Their teammates, Ryan and Elna Mitchell, have returned uh, to the tribe in Mare Roro from their recent furlough in South Africa, and they have begun to re-engage with the tribe around the gospel, and they are caring for the new believers there. Amelia Brink, who has been um, such an important team member on Team Doe, will not be returning to the village, as many of you know from her furlough in South Africa, and that is because God has provided for her a husband. And this is a bittersweet providence um, of God. The team is very happy for her, but her loss is real and it is going to be felt. So that's Team Doe. We have Team Pano as well, made up of Craig and Sarah Noyes from Vermont. 
Josh and Autumn Miller from Ohio, who were just here uh, recently. They got to stay with Jeremy and Lori for a few days, and I got to spend uh, this last Thursday evening with them. And Michelle Williford, she is also from Ohio. Uh, their churches, as I said, two churches in Ohio and a church in Vermont. They have selected a tribe, um, Pano, the Pano people, on an island off the coast. And they have gathered most, if not all, of their house building supplies, but they have not been able yet to go in to the village to do that house building. Um, they had been carrying out our much needed logistics coordinator role in Medang, staying on our property there that we rent. Um, but Team Pano is coming home for some much needed rest and refreshment and more team building, followed by, Lord willing, a relaunch next year. We have some couples in training. Uh, we have our own Daniel and Sarah Bruce. Uh, Daniel, today is Daniel's birthday, so you want to make sure you say, Daniel, are you, are you guys in here? They're out back. Oh, okay. Make sure you go out there and buy them a cup of coffee, all of you. Um, Daniel's in his first year with uh, TES here on campus, and they are members of Grace Bible Church. They're engaging in family life here in the church, you know the church is where missionary church planters are developed. I just want to encourage you to participate in their lives as you do with all the men in TES. Please get to know them, pray for them. There's another young couple, Brandon and Emma Jones. They attend another local church in the valley here. Uh, I get the privilege to meet with them regularly for preparation, for training. Please pray for their development as well within their church family in the valley. And the administrative team that I get to serve with here uh, week in and week out, every week I get to sit with Jeremy Lehman, as I said, who is our business manager. Jeremy um, is, you, you just need to know that Finister Vision would not be standing today if it was not for Jeremy Lehman. And I can say that, I would say it even if he was here, but they're out of town. But I'm going to say even more, uh, I, I can't tell you what a, what a benefit it is to have somebody overseeing just the operations and the business side of things who actually had, has been in Medang for five years and established that role and knows what our missionaries deal with in um, the tribal context. Uh, he is an indispensable part of this, um, of this ministry. And then the same could be said of our communications manager, who is Cameron Dodd. Uh, Cameron, having been in the tribe with her family for a couple of years. Um, she knows what it's like to be there. She knows the training required. She's, she doesn't speak. I, I, listen, I'm the guy who knows the least of what's going on. And I'm surrounded by these people who have been there and they've done it. And um, it is of great benefit to me. So when she helps me to communicate and uh, to display what Finister Vision is all about, she, she does it from experience, not just from a theoretical knowledge. And so I get to, Kim and I get to meet with Cameron every week, and I meet with Jeremy every week, and I'm just so blessed um, to be able to work with these people. Let me um, finish up by just giving you um, some prayer requests. Can I do that? I'm going to give you three. Obviously, the first one is to please be praying for Team Medang, okay, that it would be formed out of Community Baptist Church in Stewart, Florida. Uh, please be praying for them. Secondly, we have also, as Finister Vision, we've had to make an important transition financially as a ministry this year in the last six months. Finister Vision has been where you send your financial support for missionaries, and that's not going to change. That stays the same. You just keep doing what you're doing. For those of you who are supporting missionaries, thank you so much for just doing what you do and being an encouragement to your missionary. Um, but that has been the only financial support that comes into Finister Vision and goes out of Finister Vision. But now, in addition to that missionary support, Finister Vision itself now is in need of financial support uh, and partnership so that as a ministry, we can do some things better so that we can better administrate um, our care for missionary church planting teams um, so that we can broaden our church recruiting efforts and church partnerships. And we need support to help cover our property needs in Medang. And we just need that support to provide the necessary leadership that Finister Vision needs to be a blessing to churches and missionaries as they 
engage in the Great Commission to the ends of the earth. Many of you have begun to support Finister Vision uh, in addition to your missionary support already this year. Thank you so much for doing that. It's so encouraging um, as we try to strengthen Finister Vision and as we try to broaden our ministry as well. Please pray with us for God to provide for the, um, our ministry's needs. If you would like to uh, give to Finister Vision, you go to our website. You see our website up there, finistervision.org. And you just go to the donate button and you click. And when you get to the donate page, there are two options for you. One button will say donate to a missionary. And the other one says to donate to where most needed. That where most needed button is where you donate just to the organization, to the ministry itself. Um, and that gets to where it needs to go. Um, we would appreciate your help with that if you can. So please pray for God's provision for this, uh, in this ministry that way. And then lastly, number three, we are aiming to strengthen our training for the missionary church uh, planners that are sent, that we partner with churches to send along. Listen, it is the church's responsibility to train pastorally their missionaries into qualified character and ability, to train them theologically. That's the church's job. That's not our primary task. That is the church's job. Our job is to train them for the specific context of where they're going. That gets added on at the end of all of that training that a church does for them. It doesn't make sense for us as a parachurch ministry to provide our specific context training without the church's role in their training. It makes no sense for us to do that because we do not have authority to qualify somebody and we do not have authority to send somebody. The church does. But when we do our training, I'm, I'm burdened to make sure that we have done all that we can to make sure that our teams are equipped as they should be. Both missionary teams that we have sent, Team Doe and Team Pano, have faced and endured great challenges on the field. And so I want to make sure that we are doing everything that we can on our side. And next week, I get to travel to San Diego uh, and learn as much as I can about Radius International, which is a training ministry that sends missionary, uh, that trains missionary church planners. They do not send. They just train missionary church planners to unreached language groups. Uh, These are amazing, like-minded, and theologically similar, and church-centered brothers and sisters in Christ who have tons of experience doing this, missionary church planting among unreached language groups. They've done it um, in Papua New Guinea and other places. And they have a very robust nine-month training that takes place from September to May, and they do it across the border in Tijuana. So they take their missionary church planners and they go across into a different culture, into a different language, and they start the whole process there of training them. And I've been in contact with their president, Brad Buser, and I'm very hopeful that we can um, have some kind of partnership with them, perhaps, so that we can take our training to the levels that uh, it needs to be so our, our church planning teams are best equipped before we send them. So please pray for wisdom and for clarity about how to provide the best training possible. Um, the church has to send finishers. That's what we talk about a lot. The missionary church planters have to send finishers, not just starters. Starters are a dime a dozen. Finishing the work of missionary church planting has every possible obstacle imaginable in its path. Just read the book of Acts. There are countless opportunities for the Apostle Paul to lose heart and to give up and to go find something better to do with his life. But he knows there's nothing better to do with his life, even if, it is, if he is to die in accomplishing it. That is a life well spent. So the local church has to send finishers, and we want to participate with that. Um, and so I just ask for you to, to pray uh, that we will be, that the churches will, will equip their missionary church planners the way that they can and should, 
and that we also, in our unique role, will be able to do that as well. Help us to do our due diligence. Please pray for that. If you don't receive any of our communications, but you would like to uh, receive them, you can just email contact me at fvpng.org, and um, we'll get your information. Give me as much information about yourself as you like, as you feel comfortable. Give me your name. Um, give me your um, email, of course. We'll have that if you email us. Uh, if you have a street address that you want to give us, that'd be great so we can drop you a note. Um, love to even have your phone number if you want to give that. Okay, so you can email that. You can do that right now. It's even okay if you take your phone out now and do that. I'd be happy for you to do that. Um, so thank you. I, I'm grateful to the elders of Grace Bible Church. Thank you guys very much for giving me the opportunity to this morning just um, share about Finister Vision, what's been going on, and to be able to introduce it to those of you who have never heard about it or aren't really sure about it. Is there anybody here, I'm just curious, anybody here who would say this is really like the first time you've heard about what Finister Vision is? in depth, maybe just a few. So you guys already know this, this is great. All right, will you pray with me? Let's close our time in prayer. Father in heaven, um, I think about um, the, the servants you used in my life um, to bring me to the hearing of the gospel and the servants you used to then help establish me in the gospel who came alongside me, people who did not know me, people who were not like me at all. I was very different from them. I was in a different age bracket. I had different interests of every possible kind. I had different tastes than them. They, they were people I would have never hung out with and they would have never hung out with me. But they became my best friends and they helped me to memorize scripture. They helped me to understand what it meant to be a Christian I heard the gospel from strangers in a large setting. And for the first time, um, I heard that I was actually an offender. I was a rebel against you and that what was wrong with me was not something that I could fix myself, but what was wrong with me was something that only you could fix through your son, through his death and his resurrection. Lord, these were things that I would have never heard or come up with on my own. They were not the solutions that I was looking for in all of my discontentedness. This was something so alien to me that came to me from outside of me, from people who were not like me. And all of that happened in a small little town in Nebraska in 1985. Lord, I'm thankful for that. I th and I know that there are many similar stories like that. Lord, thank you for the moms and the dads. Thank you for the siblings who shared the gospel with these here. Thank you for Sunday school teachers. Thank you for pastors. Thank you for classmates who shared the gospel, who came alongside these here and helped disciple them. Thank you for small group leaders. Lord, thank you for the strangers that you brought into their lives who just witness to them and testified of your goodness and your grace to them in Jesus Christ. Lord, may we never forget that we did not get here any other way except by somebody having the courage to open their mouth and faith came from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And Lord, that is exactly the same thing that must happen on the other side of the world among unreached language groups. Somebody who's not like them will have to go to them. Somebody who doesn't sound like them and doesn't have the same interest as them will have to go and be courageous. I pray for Grace Bible Church. I pray, Lord, that you will raise up many, many more. Lord, may we not think that because we sent a team, we're done. I pray, Father, that you would even begin to lay it on the hearts, if you haven't already, for more to surrender their lives to you in this call to take the preaching of the gospel to the ends of the earth so that a church may be planted among a people who would never have a church unless they go. Lord, I lift up to you Community Baptist Church in Florida, and I pray for Philip and for the Twombleys and others there, Lord, that you will uh, make it unmistakably clear who can partner with the Twombleys and go to form this team in Medang. Lord, I lift up to you Team Pano this morning for Craig and Sarah, Josh and Autumn and Michelle, Lord, as 
three of them are already home. Lord, I pray for the rest and refreshment to begin and to take as long as is needed for them, Lord. May they benefit as I know Zach and Cass have in the family as they've been home. Lord, I pray for them to be refreshed so that clarity of thought can even uh, take greater hold in their hearts and minds about what you've called them to be and do. And Lord, I lift up to you, Team Doe. I lift up to you, the cans this morning and Thank you for them, Lord. Thank you for the fact that they are laboring hard, persevering. I pray for their time home would be, that it would be refreshing to their souls, that they would find your word to be the reviving, um, the perfect reviving tool that you have it be according to Psalm 119. And I pray, Father, that you will bring this little one safely into the world and that uh, their family would rejoice in your addition to it. I pray for Ryan and Elna in the tribe now, Lord, to uh, become re-engaged and reacquainted quickly and that you would give them fruitful ministry, that you would protect your own who are there in the tribe. And Father, we um, are just grateful that we even have this privilege. Lord, it would have been enough for you to save us and say, now go sit over there in the corner while I do my work. But Lord, that's not what you've done. You've taken enemies, you've made them your children, you've turned them into your servants, and Lord, you desire us to participate with you to the ends of the earth, Lord. Raise us up to do that even here among the neighbors, the classmates, our co-workers, strangers that we come into contact with, Lord, and put it on the heart of many here to go to the ends of the earth with the gospel. Thank you for this opportunity, this privilege to do so, and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You guys are dismissed until 1015.